Happy Sunday. Thank you guys for taking the time out to join us. It's a privilege to stand before you again this morning. Last week, we had to do this presentation, but we had some technical difficulties, and we didn't get to bring it, you know, present it. So here I am. I have, I have a second chance to bring it to you. There is um, a name in, this, in, this, in the study that I was going through here in Colossians that I had a problem pronouncing. And it's a Greek name. The name is Pathro. Maybe you guys out there, you speak Greek. You could probably help me later on. You know, tap me on the shoulder. Let me know, well, did you say it right or, you know, or not. Just kidding, you know. Um, but we're going to get into the lesson today. All right? Um, we're going to, um, the, the title of our lesson is Growing Up in Christ. First, um, we're going to look in, in um, the introduction to the scripture, why Paul wrote this letter. Here, the goal of this epistle written by Paul was to give direction on how to live for God. And also, it's to show Jesus' preeminence and sufficiency. And uh, also, to lead them in the right direc direc direction away from false teaching, away from false teaching, all right? So here, this name that I, I was, you know, I had mentioned earlier, Pathro, has brought news, you know, to Paul concerning the church in Colossae. So what was going on in, in the church in Colossae? Paul is going um, to give direction on, on where they should go. Paul started this letter, like all the other epistles, he established his authority in Christ. Paul is very skillful on how he delivered his message to the church. So, as we go now, we'll see in, in, in verse 1. The Apostle Paul um, means one that is commissioned or one that is sent. You know, and that's in verse 1. I'm just going to just give a, a quick, um, you know, review of what we're going to, you know, what's ahead in, in this lesson. He says, um, in other words, Paul is saying he is not self-appointed, but he was commissioned by God himself. In verse 2, he gave um, them accolades, you know, uh, of what they were doing, how, how good they were. And he also, in, in verse 3, he thanked God for, for, for them. In verse uh, 4, he praised them for their faithfulness and their love, the love that they showed towards all the saints. In verse 5, he gave them hope. He gave them hope. In verse um, 7 and 8, he teach them and give them instruction. In verse 9 and 10, he said he told them to walk in wisdom and in, walk in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And in, um, in verse 12, he says, hold on to the promises you know, that is laid up for you in heaven. In, in verse 13 through 14, where we'll end, he talked about the redemption through the blood of Jesus, the redemption that we have in him. As Paul began this letter, as Paul began this letter, he introduces himself in a few verses. He tells the saints, he said, he's praying for them, you know, and his prayer was, um, you know, was to encourage them. But during, if you look at the letter of what he was saying, his letter, you could see his heart and his love for them because they're standing for Jesus. You know, though Paul have never been to this church in Colossians, you know, Paul was encouraged to hear that they're living for God, that they're standing for him, that they're standing for him. And we're just going to jump right in. In, um, Corinth, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, 
1 through 4, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and to Timothy, our brother. And it says, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. He says, um, the faithful brethren in Christ, who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to, to God and the Father for Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for the saints. Now, I want you to look at the first verse in the that, in that, um, chapter, chapter uh, verse 1. Paul established who he is and the authority that he has. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, now, if you, if you go back in the history during this time in, 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 in um, Colossae, there was a lot of people going around spreading false doctrine and, and they, you know, they were very pompous and proud about you know, who they are. So Paul was saying here, I am apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, I am apostle that God has chosen you know, to, to deliver his message. So Paul wasn't saying that he came in his own, at his own will or in his own strength. So here Paul is going to re represent Christ. Not just represent, but represent. He's going to show them Christ in, 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 in ways that, you know, as we go, you'll see. So how do we know that these folks will walk in and live in right? If we look in, in verse um, 3, he says, We give thanks to God and the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Praying for you always, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love for all the saints. How do we know that we have Christ? In, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 2, verse 4. This is in my notes. It's not in the, um, my slides. He says, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and power. So Paul was basically saying there that his, um, his presence is not what he wanted him to look at. He, you know, his words is not, they, he don't want to pay so much attention to Paul's word, but listen to the, the value of what he's saying. Because he says that I didn't come with enticing words of man, but you know, I came, you know, with the wisdom of God, and I come with the demonstration of the Spirit of God. So that that's what uh, differentiated Paul from all the other guys that was there, you know, throwing their, their stuff around, thinking that you know they are um, somebody when they are not. All right. This small church is one of the smallest churches in, in, the, in the New Testament. It says um, it was not their might or the work that the, this little group of Christians, you know, has done. Paul didn't, you know, commend them because of the great preaching or their generosity. You know, Paul was very, you know, encouraged, like I said earlier, about, you know, how how they, um, they, they show love for, for the saints. And um, Paul said he prayed on their behalf because of the faith that they had in Jesus Christ and the love they have for the others. So Paul is motivated to, to write. Even though Pathros came and told Paul about all the, the stuff that was going on there and the false um, doctrine during this time. So Paul was here, was telling them, Listen, you know, um, you know, be strong, be, be strong in the Lord. Focus on, on what is here, what is present before you. Don't, you know, allow, you know, the world to take you away. During this time, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of, uh, most in this church, most of the people in that town, they were, um, they were Gentiles. They were, yeah, they were Jews there. But, you know, in comparison to the Gentiles, it was, you know, maybe 22 to 1. 
But in this church, it was a very small church, and, and during that time, they went from house to house to, um, to teach the word. So, Paul here was saying that because of the love that you have for one another. Now, in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, it says here, A new commandment have I given unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that, ought, that he also may love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. Listen, sometimes it's not easy to love when you're not getting that love back. Sometimes it's not easy when you try to you know, embrace a person and they're pushing you away. And here, um, John was trying to show them, listen, the only way the world will see that we have Christ is when we show love. It's when we, we, um, we express our love, not just with you know, lip service, but you know, our actions. Now, come with me a, a, a minute. Let me just try to paint a picture for you. Imagine here a couple gets married. They're on their honeymoon. And, you know, they go in places and, and they, they, they enjoy themselves. And the husband, you know, has not shown anything about showing love to his wife. He, you know, all he's saying is, is with his mouth, but his action doesn't back it up. How do you think that wife would feel? Even though they, yes, they're on their honeymoon, one, maybe one of the biggest times, you know, in their lives. But if there's no action behind it, somebody say actions speak louder than words. So our action has to back up what we're saying. So if we want the world to see the love of God, we have to love one another. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, you know, how can we love God who we have not seen if we can't love our brothers who we can see? Only way to grow up in Christ is that you have to show love. You have to let love be a part of your everyday walk, not just with lips, but your action has to back it up. Our love for one another is imperative in the kingdom of God. Our love to one another is very, very important to the world. Yes, the world might not accept Jesus for who he is, but, you know, if they see us, they will say, man, those people are, are different. They, 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 don't, um, they don't show, you know, um, that disconnect, that, that bitterness and, and that separation. But through everything, they just loving each other and just showing love. And this is what the church here was doing. They, they were very, very caring and very supportive of, 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 you know, with their faith and their love for one another. So Paul was very, very impressed with this church. So in, 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 um, in um, Colossians chapter 1, 5 through 8, he says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where ye have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it, as it is in the world, and he says, um, bring it forth fruit as do also in you, since the day he heard of it, he know the grace of God in truth. So here we go again when he's talking about um, a fruit, the fruit that, that bear it, the love that, that comes forth, the love that, that um, you know, you demonstrate. You know, they, the, the Colossians church, they heard it and they live in it. They, they're not just saying it. You know, um, in verse 7 he says, he says, as he says, as he also learned of, here go the name again, Pathros, our dear fellow servant. He says, whom is for you as a faithful minister of Christ, who also have declared, uh, declared unto us the love, of, the love in the Spirit. So he was saying there, Pathros was you know, uh, very instrumental in, in, in this letter coming to you. Because when pa when when Pathos went to seek out Paul, you know, and tell Paul all what's going on in the church at the time, 
there was false doctrine, there were heresies, there was all a whole lot of stuff going on in the church during this time. And Paul was given a word to encourage them. Now, because of the size of the church, they were very small, and sometimes they felt like they weren't, you know, they weren't making a difference. I want you to know that God worked with a few. God could work with, you know, a big, gigantic group, but I just want you to know that God will move, work with a few because, you know, when a few come through, then they won't take that praise for themselves. If you guys remember um, Gideon, Gideon, Gideon went to, um, you know, Gideon at the time, um, Israel was in bondage, you know, um, and there were no sword in the land to fight against their enemy. The enemy took their sword and, and, and they, you know, had to go to the enemy if they wanted to get like a, 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 a we would say back home, a machete or a knife, they would have to go to the enemy. And they, you know, it's like basically the enemy wanted to know every piece of weapon that they have. So Gideon here, you know, um, was very troubled because the, the um, enemy would come in and they would take their food and, and they wouldn't have anything. So Gideon was hiding and, and, and you know, trashing the, the, the wheat, you know, in a, in hiding someplace, doing it. And when um, um, God came to him and said, Gideon, the, the man of God, the great man of God, Gideon was there. My family is the smallest family in Israel. What are you talking about? God said, you know, he's going to use him. God sent Gideon to the river and he says, listen, you know, he, Gideon had too much people to, for God to give him the victory. So Gideon, um, God told Gideon, if you, if, if you um, I'm going to show you who I'll choose. If you tell these people to drink water from the, the river. And he says, those that laugh like a dog, you know, those you'll keep, but those that didn't pay attention, they just went down and started drinking and not paying attention to their surroundings. And it was a few that God used to deliver Israel. So here in Colossae, it was a small group of Christians, but the Apostle Paul spoke many times about how, you know, how big God is and how Jesus is, is better than everything else, all the other gods that's there. In in uh, first in, in Colossians chapter one nine through ten, he says, "For this reason, I also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you." And he says here, "And to ask, cease to pray for you, and to ask that he may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and all." spiritual understanding, filled with all wisdom and all knowledge and understanding. Now, I want you to know that here he was telling them, listen, it doesn't matter. It's a few, or it's a few of you, but if you have the wisdom and the knowledge of God, you're able to do mighty things. You're able to do exploits. But you need to have that wisdom of God. You need to have the understanding of who God is. Spiritual understanding. A lot of times um, we are lack, lacking spiritual understanding, especially when you know we see what's going on today in the world with you know this this um, virus just running rampant. In it, God is, has not left us alone. He's with us. He said He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. I just want you to keep in mind. Yes, you might you know have lost your job. You might, you know, be affected by this virus or, you know, a family or, or a friend or somebody that you know that's close in your circle. Maybe, you know, they have lost their life to this virus. Don't give up hope. In it, see God. Get the spiritual understanding of what, why, and what God is doing in it. In verse 10, he says here, that he may walk worthy of the Lord in full in, in fully praising him, bringing forth fruitful, being fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. Here we go again. Being fruitful 
and grown in the knowledge of God. So, you know, um, we have to be fruitful. We have to be fruitful in God. We have to be fruitful in the Word. The only way we're going to be fruitful is that we have to take the Word and we have to insert it in our heart. We have to insert it in our mind. We have to be captivated by the Word. Are intoxicated by the word. I like that. We have to be intoxicated. We have to be so full of the word. And another scripture is to let the word of God dwell in you richly. Now, if my title is saying growing up in Christ, how do we grow up in Christ? Is that we have to dig deep within ourselves. We have to lay aside everything that will hinder us from growing. We got to, he was telling Colossians, the Colossians church here. He says that, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, that you may walk according to will, in full praise in Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increase in the knowledge of God. How can we increase the knowledge of God? It's getting into the Word of God. It's getting into prayer, getting into the closet. He says, you know, pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray and, and get connected. Pray and, and break down those strongholds. All right? Pray and, and ask God, give me an ear to hear. You might feel discouraged. You might feel like you, you have um, no hope. I just want you to remember, Jesus said if you trust him, he will come through. He might, come, he might not come when you want him, but he's right on time. All right, he's right on time. So during this time in, 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 in the Corinthians church, in the Colossians church, there was a lot of heresies, a lot of false doctrine. A lot of stuff we taught that was contrary to the Word of God. A lot of stuff that was going on. So let's look at, you know, counterfeit for a minute. Counterfeit. Here in the United States of America, it says that um, over $82.1 million of counterfeit money is used over $82 million is used. And it says, what are the best, best practices, you know, to, to fight against counterfeit? The best practices are that they would teach, you know, the folks that handle the money. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a bank teller. Maybe it's those that work in the supermarket. You know, they teach them what is the right money. And remember, they, they have gotten so sophisticated with, you know, copying you know, the money, that if you sometimes, if you don't have the, the skillful eyes to, to see, you know, you can't tell the difference. Because, you know, uh, I, I know back in the days what they used to do, they probably still do it now. They had a pen where they used to mark the money with this black pen. And if the color changes, you know, to a certain color, the ink that's on the money, then they know it's fake. But they've gotten so sophisticated that they, they're taking the, the, the money and what they do, they erase, you know, it, maybe it's a paper, you know, um, or they get the paper like the, the same money, the same paper that they use, and they have it printed, you know, with, the, with all the watermarks and everything on there. Now, if you don't have a skillful eye, you know, you might end up, you know, being cheated out of, you know, um, if, you are, um, if you are a customer or, or a teller, are an owner of a, a business, you know, you might end up selling something and that money is fake. So what they, what they, they, they did here, the U.S. Um, uh, Secret Service reported that, you know, last year over $8.2 million, you know, were, were, um, were used. And it, it, um, when it, um, it came through that, People have lost, you know, millions of dollars because they, they spend the fake money to buy, you know, products and, and, and services. So it is very important. It says here, um, it says that it, the most important, when I say best practices, so what they, the government, you know, has done, the bank, um, what they did, they trained those folks in the bank. He says, that, you know, the most important time to teach somebody, you know, about counterfeit money is like when they're working in a bank for 90 days. I'm not sure why they choose that, that, that particular um, amount of time. 
but he says they teach them how to, to, to understand what is a counterfeit and what is, you know. Now, my thinking would be, I'm going to teach you all about the counterfeit. But they do it another way. They teach them what the real money is. That when the counterfeit comes around, you know, they can't, they were able to tell the difference. Same thing was going on here in the Colossians church. False doctrine was going on. All kind of foolishness is going on in the, in the church. And, you know, um, so the counterfeit and the real, the counterfeit sometimes it looks so close to what the truth is that it's hard to tell the difference. <clears throat> it's hard to tell the difference. So they train new employees on how to differentiate, you know, what the, what the, what the real money is and what they, they need to focus on. So it's easier to identify the fake, the counterfeit from the real. Same thing when it comes to the word. You know, he says, um, in Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 10, he says, he says, Fill with the knowledge and the wisdom and spiritual understanding so you could uh, detect false doctrine. Sometimes it sounds so good. It sounds so true that if, if you're not, you know, really paying attention, you could fall for it. You know, I, I didn't want to go, um, I didn't want to go here, but when you think about salvation, salvation is, you know, according to what the apostles taught. You know, um, in Acts chapter 2, he says, you know, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now some people say, oh, it was just for that time. But he says, every one of you, not some of you, every one of you. Now they take that, that scripture and they say, oh, that was just for the apostles. All we got to do, we just got to believe in the Lord. We just got to accept the Lord. And now you hear everybody, you know, I accept the Lord. I accept the Lord. And now he's my personal Savior. But they skip. That, and they go all the way to the epistles. Now, if you want to see the acts of the church, you got to go into the book of Acts. What the apostles taught, what the apostles did, what they did, you know, daily they were breaking bread. And so they continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So what was going on here <clears throat> is that people don't take the word for themselves. They listen to what, you know, some man is saying. They listen to what, you know, some theologian that is, is saying that this is what needs to be done. This is what we need to teach. We don't need to receive the Holy Spirit anymore. All we need to do is just accept the Lord. And once you say, I accept the Lord, you are saved. One of the things that really irks me is that when I'm driving and I turn the radio on, I'm here a preacher and he's preaching a word and he, he sounds so, you know, uh, powerful and he, he's going in. And then at the end of the message, he says, okay, repeat after me. I said, hold up, hold up, wait, 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 wait. I don't see that in scripture. Now, if the person will repeat after that pastor and they don't have a sincere heart, they didn't receive salvation. Salvation is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name. And I, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe you have a family member that you're dealing with and you're telling them about this great salvation that we receive and they saying that, no, but I accept the Lord as my personal Savior, and, and now I'm saved. Just show them in the scripture. The Bible says that salvation is through, you know, the apostles taught that you have to repent, you have to be baptized in Jesus' name, and you have to receive the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues. So when you do that, then you receive salvation. Now they have the nerve to say, after they say, repeat after me, they said, go and find a, a church that's teaching, you know, the word. Why are they leading people astray? People are led astray because they allow themselves to be led astray. Nobody wants to take the word because somebody has a name behind them. I'm pastor so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, I'm reverend so-and-so, I'm, I'm, I'm prophet so-and-so, so 
whatever they say, people take it and run with it. Mega churches, a whole lot of people in there, and they're not saved. Yep, you might think, oh my God, he, he went there. I'm going to tell you why we have to go there. Because the Bible says that, that in the last day, there's going to be strong delusion, and it's going to draw people away. I know people that even or believe like we do in, in, in the one God that we serve. You know, here, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. And people take it and say, oh, you know, he was saying one, but one don't really mean one. So my question to that person that's saying one don't really mean one. If, you, if I loan you $100 and I say, you know, I need my $100 back, that $100 you took from me, you say, you know what, it don't really mean one. It means three. You're going to be like, hold up, hold up. No, 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 no. I only, you only gave me 100 So what are you asking for three? So do you see my point? One is one. Number singular, one. So when he says that he is one, there's no ifs and buts but about it. It's only one God. So the Colossians church was under heavy um, scrutiny uh, about you know, the doctrine of Christ and the, the false doctrine was trying to spill over in the church. There were people coming in and talking a whole lot of stuff. So Paul was here telling the Colossians church, listen, stand for what, what your, your, the word says. Stand for what you believe in. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the word of God abide in you. The only way you're going to grow up in Christ is that you've got to get in him. You've got to live in him. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. All right? In Colossians chapter uh, 1, 11 through 12, he says, Strengthen with all might according to his glo the glorious power, with all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has you know, uh, qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the same in light. Strengthen. He's telling the church here, you've got to be strong. You've got you to walk in the power of his might. In the glorious power. You see how many times it's like he's repeating himself here. Power and might, it's, you know, it's, it's, it could use interchangeable. Power, might, patience. And I, I find it, you know, that he says long suffering with joy. When you think about long suffering, the flesh don't want to suffer. The flesh don't want to deny itself. The flesh want to be gratified. You know, um, here in, in the Colossians church, it was written, you know, not too far after Jesus Christ had died. Some of these people knew about Jesus' you know, suffering and, and his crucifixion and him dying on the cross. And now when Peter comes and telling them, you have to be strong in the Lord. You have to, you know, you have to be uh, um, with patience and long suffering, with joy. The joy is not an earthly joy. You know, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. In him we have joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And that's what, you know, Paul was telling them, that you have to let the joy of God, just let it just permeate, let it run through you, let it live in you. Give thanks unto God, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. So he's telling them that, listen, you may be small, you may be a small group, but listen, this inheritance that you have, you were taken out of darkness. You were brought into the kingdom of God. You were brought into the, the light of God. So we got to constantly stay in the light. Darkness will come, but we got to let our light so shine before man. Let me see the good work and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So we got to constantly stay connected. Stay connected. And in Colossians chapter um, 1, 13 through 14, he says here, And he has delivered us from the power of darkness. He says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. And to, con you know, he has convert us, or he translate us, some, trans some translations, he translate us into the kingdom of his dear son, who he loved. He says here, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of 
So he's he, he assuring the current the Colossians church that listen, he has delivered you from the power of darkness. Because remember, darkness has a power that it, when it holds on to you, it doesn't want to let go. So we gotta remember. It was written all the way back then, and it's relevant to today. It's relevant to today that we were delivered out of the power of darkness, and he has bring, brought us into his marvelous light. So we got to remember that we were redeemed. Every day I don't feel like I'm saved. Every day I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I should live for God. Some days I just want to go back in the world when I feel you know, the world pulling on me. But I thank God it's not in the way that I feel. It's not in the way that I feel. Remember Jesus' temptation. If you um, turn these stones to bread, you know, fall down and worship me. You guys remember when Lucifer took him and, and, and tempted him and all this? What Jesus said, it is written. Remember, it's not how we feel. It's in the word. All day I don't feel like loving my wife sometimes. Sometimes I'm so upset. And the kids, I, I just want to just, you know, get out of there. But it's not how I feel. It's what's written. It's just, you know, you have to love, you know, regardless of how you feel. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus loved us when we were unlovable. Jesus, you know, died for us when we were in our sin. He, his love is, is unchangeable. There's nothing that we could do, you know, that could turn his love away. He says, no greater love than this, than a man would lay his life down for his friend. He called us friends. Even when we were sinners, he called us friends. He wants us to stay close to him. He had redeemed us. He has changed us. So we got to continue in his love. And here it says in, in uh, Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For God, who command the light to shine out of darkness, had shone in our heart, to give us the light of the, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in darkness, remember in, in Genesis, darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And this, he says, let there be light. So he, he dispersed the, the darkness. He, he consumed the darkness. He, he um, overcame the darkness. So my, this last verse here, I'm going to read it again in, in 2 um, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who had commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. He commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When we come to Jesus, Yes, he brought us up out of darkness, like he was still in the Colossians church. He brought you out of darkness. You've got to let the light of God shine. You've got to let the light of God shine. And, and sometimes, even when you don't feel it, not sometimes, whenever you don't feel it, you've got to let your light shine. He says that, he says that we are a light, that a city that's set up on a hill that cannot be hid. He says no man... No man will take a candle and hide it. If you have a candle and you light it and you hide it, it's either going to go out or it's going to burn something down. He said they take the candle and they put it on a stick that is, is spread all over the room that everybody can see. That's how we got to be. We got to be a light that's set up on a hill. We got to be like a, 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 a um, like this, what do you call it? The, um, the lighthouse. When they're a ship, Back then, before they had all this technology, when a ship was on, you know, out in the sea, they had the lighthouse, and that light used to shine. And that's how the ship would know, you know, somebody may get a glance of the light, and that's how they would know what direction to go in. You know, um, so it's the same thing. The world is lost. We are living in a fallen world. The world is looking for an answer. The world is in darkness. We have to let our light shine. Let it shine when you don't feel it. Let it shine when you don't, you know, when you don't know who's watching you. Let it shine. Just remember, God knows 
exactly where you are. Whatever you're going through, the light of God wants to shine in your heart. The light of God wants to illuminate the darkness. My encouragement to you this Sunday morning is hold on to the light. Let the light take over. Let the light shine in every area of your life. Let the light of God shine that there will be no darkness. Let the light of God consume. Let it, let it, it take over. He wants to do it, but will you let him? He said, I will work, but who will let it? The Colossians church, in, in the, the 14 verses that I read, he was telling them, listen, it doesn't matter how small you think you are. He says, in that house, there are many vessels. There's vessels of wood, vessels of clay, you know, vessels of, of all different kinds of vessels. But he says, but if a man would purge himself from this, he would be a vessel unto honor. And that is my encouragement to you today. Yes, we don't get to come together and, and sit in the service and on the pews and worship together. But right where you are at home, you could worship right where you are at home. This is where your tests come. This is where everything comes. I just want you to remember, stay focused. Stay connected. Stay, you know, in touch with God. Don't let it be, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to get back in my Bible when we open back the church. Remember, Jesus Christ, he says, your body is the temple of the living God. You are the church. You are the bride of Christ. So you've got to remember who you are. Don't lose your identity in the world. Don't be conformed to this world. This is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The only way we get a renewed mind is in the Word. The only way we get a renewed mind is staying in His presence. The only way we get a renewed mind, we got to stay connected. Constant connection. Growing up in Christ is daily. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. You know, you know He that abided in me, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, abide in the Word. Let the Word of God abide in you. Jesus loved you. He loved you enough that he came down. He didn't stay up here in glory. He came down, inject himself in this world as a man suffered and died for you. Whatever you're going through, if it's a financial disaster, if it's a financial need, if it's a physical need, Jesus is able to meet that need. But will you trust him today? Will you trust him? Yes, I know you'll trust him. I can hear your heart saying you're going to trust him. Let's trust him together. Let's hold on to him. Let's hold on to his word and see what he has for us. He is the God of his word. Take him to his word. Say, Lord, you said in the word here, you might be going through a financial strain. You might go into, you know, problems in the family. Like everybody, everybody's family has some situation that they're dealing with. But just remember, we are the family of God. We are the children of God. And we have to grow up. Someday, let's go up right now. Let's go grow up in Him. Let's go deep in Him that we may grow and be strong. I'm going to pray for you this morning. I'm going to pray that God will move in the home. I pray that whatever situation that you're going through, that God will meet you right where you are. That God will meet you right in that situation and that He will supply that need. All right? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning. Uh, morning, O oh God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, that we could stand, we could sit, we could walk, we could talk. Father God, we are in Sunday school. Jesus, we pray for your presence to rest. We pray for your anointing to fall. We pray, God, that yoke will be destroyed. Help us, O oh God, to lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily beset us. And help us, O oh God, to run this race that was set before us, O oh God. Father, we just ask you, let your light shine in us, O oh God. Let your light illuminate everything that's darkness, O oh God. Let your light, O oh Father God, take over, Jesus. Lord, we give ourselves to you, God. We pray, Father, for the blood of Jesus to wash, wash everything, Lord. Wash my mind, wash my heart, wash everything, God. I surrender all to you, O oh God. Father, right now, Jesus, I forgive others now as I want you to forgive me. Lord, I pray for those, Father God, that are struggling. Father God, whatever is a sexual sin, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever sin it is, God, I pray, Jesus, that, Lord, God Almighty, we'll get a hold of ourselves because you said 
It doesn't matter what sin it is. You said sin shall not have dominion over us. I pray this morning, God, that every yoke will be broken. Every bondage will be loose. Father, I pray, God, that you supply that need financially, physically, mentally, psychologically, oh God. I pray that you cover that family as they sit and hear my voice, oh God. You speak to their hearts. You speak to their needs. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for your will to be done. Help us to grow in you. Help us to live in you. Oh, Father, let your will be done today. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. If you watch the service and you want somebody to pray for you, there will be a line, there will be a number that you could call. It will somewhere on the screen that will tell you, you know, call. Um, just, just look for that number. It's going to be somewhere, somewhere up, some part of the screen. You know, just take that number, call. Somebody will be on the other end waiting for you, waiting to pray with you, waiting to encourage you. We're looking forward to hearing from you. God bless you. Have a blessed Sunday and stay connected.